If I were to call out to you and say, what are some ways that we could make a difference, that we could be change makers, what would you tell me? Start within yourself, right? Inna Allah, inna Allah la yughayru. That it, from the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a, like a, an emphasis. Inna, anytime he starts the Quran, like inna, like I'm insisting. I'm insisting. I am not going to change your condition until you change that which is within yourselves. I'm not going to change it until you change which is in yourselves. So you're going to be walking around like you do around the Kaaba. Seven times you're going to see the same problem. Seven times you're going to see the same issue. Seven times you're going to have to face that person. Seven times you're going to be making the same dua. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is insisting that you, that you dig deeper. That you dig deeper. And that's what these lectures have to be about. Is that every time you hear them, they can't just kind of like fall on deaf ears. It has to be like you're digging, right? And when you're digging a little bit, first you move the soil a little bit. Nothing, you don't see any change. But you keep digging, you keep digging, and then wow, you found some silver. You found something of value. Then you dig a little deeper, and then you find some gold. Then you dig a little deeper, and wow, you found some jewels. Then you dig a little deeper, and then you find oil that we, we can benefit a whole bunch of people. It has to be like that. That as you're listening to the lectures, as their as their as you as their recitation of Quran is 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 falling upon you, it has to be keep digging. Dig, dig, dig. Why? Because Allah says, I'm not gonna change until you change what's in yourself. And anytime we see some of the same trials that we're seeing, Allah is saying you haven't changed it yet. You haven't changed it yet. And, I, and I, listen to this, Allah is not saying, I will not change your condition until you change your masjid. I will not change your condition until you change your job. I will not change your condition until you change your husband. I will not change your condition until you change your immigration status. He didn't say any of that. He said, I will not change your condition until you change that which is in yourself. So what else did we hear? Hey, guess. To volunteer in the community. Right? You've got you to gotta dig deep. You've got to get in, roll up your sleeves, and be a part of the work. Right? You've got to volunteer. Now, when it comes to volunteering, it's a sacrifice. Because the thing about volunteering is that it's time. And time is basically, it is the moments, the hours, the days, the weeks, the months of your life. So basically, you're giving a portion of your life to assist someone else. Now brothers who are in the room, I wanna to talk to you for a minute. Because I work with a lot of different organizations, I'm literally one of the very words that fell out of two different directors mouths said, how do we bring more men and young men back to volunteer in organizations and masajid? I recently did like a, a, a poll study and it turned out like almost 80% of those who volunteer in community organizations are women. So we need our men. I know you're saying, well, we're working. Trust me, these days she's working too. <laughs> right? I know you're saying, well, you know, I'm busy. But this is why it's a sacrifice. This is why it takes you first to change your mind. You have to change your mind to say, I don't have time, make time. You know, I don't have, I don't have energy, make the energy. Push yourself. <laughs> Men and women, push yourself. Well, I don't like those people. <laughs> Usually that's it. I don't like those people. Well, that's okay, you don't have to like them. It wasn't a requirement. It wasn't a requirement. The requirement is I recognize there is a need and I'm going to lend myself in order to be of benefit. That was the requirement. What else do we hear? Volunteer, so change yourself. Volunteer, what else? Say again. Educate our young population. I'm going to add to that. Educate the young population, the middle-aged population, the old population. We need an education. We need an education. What do I mean by that? 
This is actually a really sore spot for me. And the reason why I say it's a sore spot is because we have a challenge in our community that we, and this challenge in our community puts us at a very delicate place to be in. We have a tradition that is based upon sound knowledge and sound example. And we are, a, we are a people who believe in authentication, that whatever it is we follow, that must be rigorously authenticated. And yet, our tradition is a living, breathing tradition. So we are progressively traditional, or traditionally progressive. Meaning that we cannot be a community that when, we are re that when we are studying, that we are only studying so we can celebrate those who are in the grave. And feel like, yes, I've done something, I've learned something because I've celebrated and I've acknowledged those who are in the grave. That's, that wasn't the point. You missed the point. The point of looking at of those who have passed away, Allah yurhamahum, was to look at what did they do to draw an example of what did they do when they were in similar times, but mostly it's about extract the lesson so that you can then apply it to your current day situation. Otherwise, your movement is going to be dead if you're doing it according to those who have already in the grave. You've got to find a way to bring life and energy and a newness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are not sheep. You've got to find a way for how are you going to understand this to be relevant inside of your condition. Now, so what does that mean between the young people who need to be educated, right? And the elders who need to be educated. The thing about the young people, Allah bless you, I love you, right? Is that for the most part, we feel like it all needs to be changed, <laughs> right? All of it's dead, all of it's irrelevant, and the only thing that's relevant is that which I have come up with, <laughs> right? So sorry, so sad, that's not the case. We're still, it is 2,000, 20, and we are still drawing upon the example of El Haj Malik Shabazz and Martin Luther King from the 1960s. A time when most of you weren't even born yet. I wasn't even born yet. And yet we're still drawing upon their example. And we're going to talk about why that is in a minute. And then we have elderly who were like basically the good old golden days. The good old, basically you guys didn't do it like we did it. And you know, that was, we were the best. We did it the best. It was the best time and that's it. And the rest of you are young and dumb. <laughs> and I'm oversimplifying, but this is one of our challenges. And one is stubborn on one side and the other is stubborn on the other side. And there's not enough communication and growth and working together, but mostly why? Because there's not enough expansion of heart. We're looking at each other. This is the disease that we have to fix inside. We're looking at each other with the eye of criticism. Not the eye of love and the eye of love and the eye of acceptance. The eye of saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you in my life because there's a lesson he wants me to learn from you. And so this is where we have to do the work. How do we take our tradition and move it forward? How do we apply it to the issues of spiritual abuse? The hashtag, mosque me too. And guess what? 
putting our head in the sand is very, you know, it's, it's very similar to, I remember every time someone would talk about racism and colorism inside of the Muslim community, they would begin to recite the ayat that Allah Ta'ala created you into nations and tribes so that you may know and love each other and that there is no racism in Islam. You're right, but there is racism amongst the Muslims. And so we have the same issue when it comes to talking about spiritual abuse and hashtag mosk me too. We say Islam, you know, we raise up the flag of Khadija and we wave it like crazy. And then we wave up the flag of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And we talk about how the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam elevated the status of women. But you're not telling me how the Muslims who are present today are elevating the status of women. When we can change our mind, when we can change our understanding about the Qur'an, when we can expand our understanding about the Qur'an, we can expand our relationship with Allah, allowing us to actually have a transformation and an elevation of the soul, then we can begin to make a difference in society. Then we are empowered to go out and say, it is my job to take care of these women. It is my job to make sure that they're not sexually harassed. It is my job to make sure that these girls are not ashamed when they are molested. That I will stand up and I will fight for them with every portion in my body. It is my job to not keep it a secret amongst the aunties and the women that this happened. It is my job to make sure that there's a certain healing that happens in the world. Why? Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down his mercy upon the earth. How also do we look at him? When we look at Maryam, when Allah says that she's qanitad, she goes into an institution at that time that's m mostly male, right? And her mother, from the beginning, dedicates in her womb, whatever is in my womb, I dedicate to the service of Allah. Because her husband was basically the big sheikh at that time, which we know as the Temple of Solomon. And so Maryam's father was the, was the big sheikh and he passed away while the mother was still pregnant. So then she said, oh Allah, I dedicate that which is in my womb to the service of you. So when she gave, when she gave birth to Maryam, she said, oh Allah, I've given birth to a female child. Because she's saying, girls are not allowed to be in service in, to, in the community. They're not allowed to be in service in the religious institution. So Allah told her that the, she's, the, and the male is not like the female. I know full well what you've given birth to, right? And this is about to be something good. Just hold tight. And then subhanAllah, she becomes a change maker. She becomes technically the first female to enter into a male institution of learning. And she becomes one of the most famous women on earth. Whether you are Muslim or Christian or even other, you know Maryam, the mother of Jesus. You know her. This is big change. And she, not only did she change that on, a, on just a physical level, but in addition to that, after their abuse of her and not allowing her to study, she would continue to study and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send her the angel Jibra'il, right? Who would, and there would be food that would be brought to her from heaven that Allah would produce miracles on her hand. This is huge change in and of itself because most of us are thinking, you know, there was a debate and the Muslims must not be like other people of other faiths, right? Where we're debating whether or not she is as valuable. When we're debating the concept of he has daraja, is this means that he is actually better than her, or as it doesn't mean he has a responsibility over her that she doesn't have over him. But we're debating this issue about her soul and where she ranks. This is not from our deen, and Allah is showing proof of that in the Quran. This is not from our deen. So Maryam becomes a change maker. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then makes her hafidat because he gives her a secret. She has a relationship with the angel Jibra'il. He gives her a secret. And from that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her Sayyidina Isa. Right? She could have hid it. She could have kept it a secret. But she didn't. And then when we look at with Asiya, Queen Asiya alayhi salam, she was given the responsibility. Allah gave her the amana. Right? to hide Sayyidina Musa. And who Musa was, and who he was in reality was a matter of the unseen, right? Then we get to, when we get to Aisha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Aisha a preserver, hafidat, a preserver of Islamic law, a preserver of fiqh. When we look at Fatima Zahra, what does she preserve? She preserves Ahlul Bayt. 
When we look at Khadija radiallahu ta'ala an, Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam was given to her. And by the fact that she never spoke one ugly word, that she was never nasty, ever rude to him, that she was kind, she preserved him and uplifted him, allowing him that when prophecy came, what did she do? She received him with a gentleness and guided him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted her with the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and she was deserving of that. And she didn't change it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to preserve the Qur'an, after the time of Rasulullah wasalam, he left it in the hands of Hafsa. So when we look at this, he left the pages of the Qur'an in the hands of Hafsa. He left the recitation of the Qur'an, the preservation of the Tajweed, he left it with Umm Salama. He left his example, his prophetic example, internally in the hands of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Why am I saying this to you? These are ways that we have to begin. The first change that we have to make is an internal change. Internal change in terms of our understanding of our value of our relationship. And this is not to say so that it should be so that we can return to an, uh, to an external understanding of Tawheed. So that we can come together to make a difference to see that we have a collaborative relationship.